Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to the third uh, webinar in our Greenback series here uh, at the University of St. Gallen. It's our pleasure to welcome many of you again and some of you um, newly to, to this, this week's webinar. Um, we will address this week a particularly interesting topic, which is the dynamics of community acceptance. So um, the question of how renewable energy projects or renewable energy policies um, find majorities, um, be it in a particular setting of wind projects being deployed in a certain community, or um, as another example today, we'll, we'll look at um, a national policy like a climate policy in a, in a whole country. Um, so what are the dynamics in those processes? That's what we will focus on today. And um, I will hand it over to uh, my coworker, Nina Schneider, who is the host for today and will introduce um, our speakers. So Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Wolf, for the introduction. And good morning and a warm welcome to our speakers, Matthias Wittek, Martina Rotenberger, and Bea Petrovic, and to all our participants. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nina Schneider, and I will guide you through this webinar. Together with my colleague Bea, I'm looking forward to hosting this webinar about dynamics of community acceptance. Now I have the pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Matthias, Matthias Wittek is the technical director at EcoWind. Um, before that, he was the head of the wind energy department there, and EcoWind is an Austrian pioneer in wind power. And it has evolved from an Austrian supplier of wind turbines to a project developer and general contractor. And since 2019, um, its scope of activities has expanded and is now including solar as well. Martina Rotenberger is a student from the double degree program between the University of St. Gallen and the Paris School of International Affairs. And she studied environmental policy in her first master's year in Paris and is now finishing up, finishing up her second year in international affairs with a focus in sustainability and development. She's curr currently writing her master's thesis um, on the influence of cognitive and affective um, factors in political decision-making processes by analyzing the specific case of the CO2 law in Switzerland. And Bea is a postdoc and research associate at the Institute of the Economy for the Economy and the Environment. And she finished her doctoral thesis about the determinants of investment on solar energy or residential solar energy, and is now working on the ELAND project, which we'll hear more about later. And as already mentioned, my name is Nina Schneider. I'm a PhD student and research associate at the Institute at the University of St. Gallen, and I'm working on the Mistral project. And I would also like to give you a short or brief overview of today's uh, webinar. I'm going to start with a short introduction to the overall topic by discussing why dynamics and emotions should be considered and why they're relevant in the context of community and social acceptance of climate change mitigation measures, but also political decision making. And afterwards, Matthias will provide you with insight from the wind energy sector in Austria. He will talk about wind energy in Austria and illustrate two examples, how dynamics can play a role and share with us also some insights on successful implementations or best case practices. Afterwards, Martina will share with us her results from her master's thesis about the CO2 law in Switzerland, where she asked Swiss people about their decision and she will um, share her insights on the emotional dynamics of the referendum campaign uh, and the learnings we can draw from them. And Bea will show you some results from the ELAN project and provide you with a community tool um, to enable the involvement of citizens in clean energy infrastructure projects. And after each presentation, you have time for clarification questions. And then in the end, there will be time for discussion. So you can post your questions in the chat and I will monitor the chat and will then ask the questions in the end to the speakers. But you can also um, ask your, put, turn your microphone and camera on and ask your question directly. Um, if you choose the chat option, please um, indicate to whom the question should be raised. And one more administrative note, the webinar will be recorded and will be on YouTube available afterwards. So if you use your camera and microphone, just please be aware of that. And now, 
we come to the topic of today's webinar. So dynamics of community acceptance. Why are they relevant and why should we look at dynamics and emotions? So I think most of us know that our opinions, values, preferences um, are changing over time and that they are dynamic. And I decided to illustrate this with a rather recent um, example and a picture that everybody here is uh, familiar with. So, which I think is a really good example for dynamics. So if you think about the last um, one and a half years and you think about yourself in March last year, fall last year, but or spring this year, I'm sure that your emotions, your opinion, your evaluation of the situation changed over time. And there are different reasons for that. Um, you learn more about the subject, you talk with others about the subject, you discuss it, the situation itself might change. Um, we're influenced by the opinions of others, by the media, and the responses to political issues are dynamic. And it is really important, not only in, time, in terms of the pandemic, that we consider these emotional dynamics, but also in regards to climate change and especially climate change uh, mitigation measures. And so far, most research um, that has been looking at acceptance was cross-sectional, meaning that there was one point in time uh, where acceptance was measured, and which means that you missed the longitudinal dimension, you missed the, the changes over time. And um, here, communication is playing a key role. So the way the project is communicated, the way um, the CO2 law was communicated, communicated can play a role. The narratives we use, the frames that were being used has an influence. And also the emotions that are evoked um, have a strong influence on the dynamics and on our responses, because some emotions trigger actions while others lead to a rather passive response. And so it's really important that the, all of these aspects are considered in climate change um, research, but also in implementation processes of climate solutions. And that is why in today's session, uh, we want to give emotions and dynamics uh, the attention that they deserve. And now, I will have, now we will have our first input presentation and Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Does it work already? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity um, to talk about our experience uh, regarding social acceptance of renewables in Austria. Um, first of all, I would like to give you a short introduction of our company, of our group. So we as uh, Equint Austria, uh, we are part of the BioRE group, um, where the headquarter is uh, based in Munich. Um, yeah, here you see some figures, um, most important, we are growing uh, every day. So we are now more than 3000 employees um, in, and in 28 countries. And we were founded, Bivari was founded in um, 2009 from the Bivari Chi, which is, uh, comes from the agricultural sector. And uh, we as Ecomint are in Austria um, since 1995, active in wind. And uh, the recent years, we also added uh, the solar business. Yeah, I think uh, this is a very good uh, table for starting this uh, topic. Um, our association, uh, IG Windkraft, uh, did a survey and asked um, um, which power plants should be built in, in, in every federal state we have in Austria. And um, you see that that uh, especially wind power uh, and uh, solar power has uh, a very high acceptance rate. And uh, when I see or look at the table uh, regarding uh, wind power, I see the, the, the highest acceptance rates or percentages in that federal states which have a lot of wind power. So. Um, this is already a first indicator that uh, experience with renewable plants is a very key uh, topic or a key point uh, for the acceptance. Our positive experiences regarding the acceptance generally 
is uh, of course um, tourism. Tourism is uh, from the opposite, uh, always a, a important topic why renewables cannot be built, but we have a lot of uh, experience and examples where it works very well, definitely do not contradict each other. Um, and construction of renewables is very, very important to have experience uh, that uh, the, the people, the inhabitants know now have know-how, um, know about uh, the needs and so on. And, and uh, this is really improving the acceptance a lot, uh, meaning that the more renewable energy plants, PV, uh, hydropower plants, wind farms are installed, um, yeah, this is increases definitely the level of acceptance. Um, the more people know about renewable energy, uh, the more likely they are positive. So um, this is this are the key factors uh, which we saw also in the table uh, before um, that the federal states in, in East Austria are very, very positive and uh, West Austria is a little bit more critical. Of course, we have uh, negative experience as well. And um, I really have to point out that um, it's getting harder and harder to develop renewable energy projects. And this is uh, the main reason for it, because there are really professional opposites in uh, um, we face. They are um, against every project. So it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, it's not acceptable to them. Uh, and uh, they are in cooperation with the local opponents. So the locals um, are organizing the professionals and the professionals are paid uh, for um, yeah, fighting against the project. And, and of course, they also um, have a lot of knowledge uh, and because they are yeah, doing that uh, all the time. So they also know all the legal uh, possibilities they have um, so it's getting really harder, takes more time and also uh, raises a lot the costs for project development because you need a lot of uh, legal assistance and uh, advices. So uh, the main factor is for them, it's really easy to spread negative moods to play uh, with, with um, yeah, the people there and their fears. And um, yeah, we only can... Uh, state facts and uh, this is much more difficult um, um, to get them uh, positive the people there yeah best practice we we did um, very important is at the very beginning uh, at, the, at the stage of a project idea uh, far away from a really uh, formed project uh, it's important to involve the local municipality, the mayor, uh, the opinion maker there, um, to really explain them the need uh, and, and what such uh, um, power plants are, are improve their environment and um, what we can, how we can cooperate. Um, Yes, of course, one part of that is organization of information days, uh, informing the, the representatives before, then informing all uh, the locals um, better. Uh, our experiences is better in information days, doing more days with um, just a few visitors um, rather than having a big information event because this uh, provides a stage for the opposites as well. Um, social media, of course, is also used, but um, our experience is to, yeah, we are really careful um, using social media because this is also a good platform uh, for the opposites and you cannot really control it in which direction uh, discussion is uh, leading to. Um, improvement of the local infrastructure is uh, very important and, and uh, a good uh, possibility to get positive, um, yeah, to get the locals positive. Uh, for example, like improvement of uh, forest roads or, um, uh, yeah, digging cables in, uh, removing the overhead lines, and so these are um, 
for a project, this is our, our, our minor things to do, but uh, improves their environment and infrastructure a lot. Yeah, getting the local partners, meaning the local associations, uh, sponsoring local associations like firefighters, football club, and so on. And uh, very important, you have to be very close to the locals. So you need uh, project developers, which ideally living near to the sites where we develop. Uh, they have to know who are the opinion makers, uh, like hotel owners or uh, or doctors there and so on. So to know um, how they are thinking about such projects, to talk to them, to convince them that this is necessary and they spread um, this uh, opinion. So this is very important to know them. Um, yeah, and development of tourism concepts, which I explained before, is really a key factor um, in such region, regions like uh, in Styria, where we have uh, the Alps, and, and there is a lot of fear that uh, no tourism or the tourists will not come anymore if they see wind farms. And uh, yeah, there are quite, uh, quite uh, um, some, some projects where it was done quite good. Um, which I show you afterwards, or now a few pictures. You see here, for example, uh, a mountain bike route through a wind farm. This is in Styria and uh, Pretoria on 16 meter, 1600 meter above sea level, where you have also charging station for the e-bikes and um, and the municipality and all the tourism agencies um, um, show that route so that everybody knows. Okay, we can go there and the people. Biking, they are very interested. So when, when when we are in this wind farm, they are asking a lot of questions. So big, very positive interest in re renewables. Um, more or less on the same side, just a, a neighboring wind park, uh, Rattenarm, uh, Steinregel, we did. Um, yeah, this is, this is the same trail route. So um, there are a lot of uh, huts there. And yeah, people walking by, don't using the, don't using the, uh, um, announced or the trail route they are passing by uh, the, the wind farm and because the road is in a much better shape <laughs> so it's easy to walk yeah one very uh, famous uh, example is of course a uh, town wind farm uh, near the near, near the slopes skiing slopes and skiing area so another example that this tourism and and uh, renewables don't contradict so there is also a pv plant there and uh, what we always do when we are ready uh, with the wind farm, it's an, it's an operation, it's built. We do opening events uh, really uh, involving all the local associations um, to support us, to work together. And we have their 1,000, 1,500 uh, visitors. And yeah, this spreads also a good mood. Um, uh, welcome them and telling them, yeah, this is now your wind farm, your wind park in your region, and we would like to overhand it to you again and, uh, yeah, having fun and nice time together. So this is a very, very easy measures, but, uh, yeah, it spreads a lot of good mood. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, uh, if there are questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much, Matthias, for your honest and uh, insightful presentation on your experience with wind energy in Austria. And um, as mentioned before, we have time for the discussion in the end after all three presentations. So I'm going to give the word to the next speaker. Martina is going to present to you now her results in regards to the CO2 law. Thank you. So thank you, Nina, for the transition and also for the presentation from before. So also welcome to my presentation about the first results of my master's thesis treating um, the emotional dynamics in the referendum campaign of the Swiss CO2 law. And that is supervised by Professor Dr. Rolf Wissenhagen and by Dr. Anna Stünzi. And so I, as I only have a rather short amount of time, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the discussion round or also click on the link that I will post afterwards where you can find all the um, different um, conclusions and results found. So let's dive directly into the research context. 
So on June 13th of this year, the Swiss population rejected the Swiss CO2 law by 51.6%. However, this was not the case for the Energy Strategy 2050 um, that the Swiss voters largely accepted in 2017. So the question here that I asked myself was how come and why could this rejection happen? And more in general, what are the dynamics in referendum campaigns, specifically in the energy and climate policy domain, and how are they shaped by emotions and cognition? But um, what is exactly the CO2 law? So I will quickly guide you through. Um, so the overarching goal was to limit global warming to um, below two degrees Celsius, or if possible to one and a half degrees as committed within the Paris Agreement that Switzerland signed in 2015. And so this would then mean that uh, Switzerland would need to reduce their CO2 emissions by 50% by 2030, whereby 75% would be reached in Switzerland and 25% abroad. And one of the most um, debated, but also most important contents of the CO2 law was um, the introduction of a tax on airline tickets of um, from 30, ranging from 30 francs for inter-European flights who account for 80% of Swiss uh, air travel, up to 120 francs for intercontinental flights. And in addition to that, the tax on fossil fuels would increase and gasoline stations could uh, increase the price of the gasoline and diesel to a maximum of 12 cents per liter. And then these incomes would then um, be partly redistributed to the population um, through the health insurance, but also another part would flow into a climate fund that then um, would support technology and innovation. Um, so after almost three years of discussion within the parliament in the fall session of 2020, the Swiss parliament um, re, uh, passed the revised CCO2 law, but a facultative referendum was then seized by two committees one from the Swiss uh, People's Party or the SVP together with economic circles for whom the uh, law went too far and um, one from the French speaking part uh, regional section of climate strike movement for whom the law was too little ambitious. And um, now let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the method and data used. So in order to be able to understand the context and the voting decision, a stratified unweighed sample a representative of the Swiss adult population according to the sex, age, um, education, region and political party preference was uh, conducted with the help of Interista, which is a leading Swiss market research agency and it stayed within the fields for a week. And at the end, 757 interviewed German and French speaking uh, people, voters who uh, participated in the Swiss CO2 law uh, were to be analyzed. And now about the results. So following an effective imagery content analysis by using the so-called word association technique, one of the many questions asked in the survey was uh, the first thought or images that would come into a participant's mind when thinking about climate politics. And after this, he or she then had to rate the thought on a, on a scale ranging from very negative to very positive. Um, and the following table visualizes the outcome of these scales for the three images. And it showed how all voters in both camps, so those accepting, but also those rejecting the CO2 law had negative associations with climate policy. And from these negative pictures, um, the most prominent, prominent images and thoughts were glacier melting, but also climate warming, climate strikes, and interesting also Greta Thunberg was mentioned quite a lot of times. Then another question that was asked in the survey was, um, and still goes into the word association technique, was the three main reasons why people had accepted or rejected the law. And here, an interesting result is that the supporters of the law were most often mentioning rather big and general causes that would benefit society as a whole. So as you can see on the graph, environmental and climate protection, but also future generation and the urgent need to to do something to act were the most um, cited arguments in favor of the law. And from a thereof generated word cloud, um, one can see that the terms climate protection, but also environment, environmental protection, climate change, um, or future are the most commonly mentioned arguments within the two most cited categories.
And on the contrary, in terms of the arguments of the opponents, um, the keywords that were most often used, mentioned by, by the participants, were also those who the opponents um, used most often in their no campaign, namely expensive, useless, or unfair. And around half of the no voters also used the word too expensive within the category of too expensive. So following this cost argument, um, another interesting result shows that voters overestimated costs and underestimated the benefits of the, of the law. So in the official uh, information brochure sent to all the voters, the so-called Abstimmungsbüchlein, the federal government mentioned um, a range of prices for the airline ticket um, levy, as mentioned before, ranging from 30 to 120 francs, whereas the uh, referendum committee only mentioned the upper bound, namely the 120 francs. And similarly, also in terms of the price increase of the fuel fuels, and the, argue, uh, the government again mentioned the range um, of a maximum of 12 cents per liter, uh, whereas the referendum committee only again mentioned the upper limits. So um, the cost assessment therefore was not always based on an accurate perception of the actual bill. So, for example, in terms of the airline ticket levy, more than half of the no voters, or namely 57%, and still just under half of the yes voters, namely 45%, mistakenly believed the statement to be correct that a tax of 120 francs would be introduced for each airline ticket. So, accordingly, around half of the voting population overestimated the amount of the proposed tax by a factor of four for the vast majority of flights affected. And this distorted perception is then reinforced by the fact that the reimbursement of the CO2 tax to the population, which is already um, part of the today's CO2 law, goes largely unnoticed by the population. Because only 32% of the yes voters and only 23% of the no voters actually knew that they already benefited from a redistribution of the CO2 tax today. But de facto, 100% of the population received about 87 francs per capita in reimbursement last year from the redistribution of environmental levies through their health insurance. So a better visibility of this cash flow could increase the acceptance of incentive taxes in the future. But to conclude, um, in the analysis showed that voters in general um, had negative emotional associations with climate policy, which then also already makes it hard to kick off a positive dynamic um, for addressing climate change. And then in addition, the No campaign not only did a good job by successfully finding catchy messages that left a, um, a brand in the voters' mind, but also the reasons mentioned in favor of the CO2 law were mostly speaking about more general causes that were not as specific as the ones from the Contra campaign. And this asymmetry then was furthermore accentuated by a biased perception of the, um, of the costs and the benefits. So one can say that finding majorities for energy and climate policies not only requires positive emotions, um, but also a clear link to the benefits, not just for society as a whole, but also for individual voters is, is needed. And that's it for my presentation and my side. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the discussion round. Thank you very much, Martina. Very interesting and insightful presentation and very nice results. Um, once again, showing how important it is to, to consider dynamics in, in local responses or in responses. And now we will have a more solutions-oriented um, input from Bea. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nina. I'm sharing my screen now. Oh, good. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. I hope I'll do my best to give a, a positive ending um, to this, as, as Nina prom uh, promised. I, I would like to share with you some recommendations for um, facilitating community acceptance of clean energy infrastructures and projects. Um, these are based on my work in the ELAN project, which is a European funded project that I work in as part of my uh, research activities at the University of St. Gallen. 
so the starting point of the ELAN project is that uh, we need, of course, more clean energy project uh, to win the race to zero emission. But this would require not just a functioning technology, but also very importantly, as we just heard from the first presentation, we do need um, community acceptance. We need support from some local stakeholders. Mm. Many times, if we ignore community acceptance, this pillar, the realization of energy project gets delayed or even just don't happen. So the questions in, that was asked in the ELAN project was, so how can we achieve community acceptance? The ELAN project learns from best practices and field work uh, to put together um, a, like a citizen engagement methodology, we call it a structure best practices um, toolbox to really help facilitating uh, the development of clean infrastructure. And the approach is based on inclusive energy infrastructure planning and community engagement strategy. But how should this be done? Um, I'm gonna share with you some of the hands-on recommendations based on best practices as the one that we uh, heard today, but also on some work on the field, uh, the ELAN project is helping five very different locations implementing clean and local energy projects. These five locations are, are very different uh, in terms of context, but also located in different countries across Europe and India. And based on this field work, we are recommending uh, a structured approach to achieve facil and facilitate uh, community acceptance. I'm sharing some five key learnings with you, and I very much look forward to discuss them with you. My, our first key learning in the ELAN project is that um, First of all, it's very important to identify and map the local stakeholders. Project developers should think about who are the important players when it comes to implementation of an energy um, solution or an energy renewable energy project. They could be mapped according to their interest or acceptance of the project and according to the influence they have in the successful implementation of the project. Um, one way this could be done is how do we did it in one of the pilots in the project, the residential township of Oroville in South India. We mapped together with the project developer who wanted to install more solar and distributed storage and solar in the town. Who are the important players? And it's important to identify two groups. Um, the local ambassador first, who are those who are interested in the project, supportive of the project, and can have a positive influence in his implementation. And the other important group is the group that has to be engaged. Those who are not very much interested yet in the project, so they are not opposing, but they are not very supportive of it, but they have a high influence. They are the decision opinion makers that uh, Matthäus mentioned in his presentation. So these very two groups are very important to be identified at first, the local ambassador and the target of the engagement strategy. Second learning uh, from um, our experience is that it's very important from the very beginning, and this is something was already mentioned, to understand the community values, priorities and practices. That's because designing energy solution in a way that is consistent with the community values, the local stakeholders values, and in a way that address their own priorities, the community challenges there, is a key to successful implementation. Here again is how we did it in the, in the ELAN project. And we can see here to a survey and some interviews with key stakeholders, we just mapped what, which were the community challenges, which, which was the vision of the community, what were the top communication cha channels there, and the energy knowledge and the energy knowledge of the community. And that helps adapting the design of the project, but also the communication around the project. Third key learning here would be to understand stakeholders' views and emotions regarding the projected project. So 
the planned project in the case of the Oroville Township that I mentioned before was installing the new solar PV and new battery storage, having more people connecting to the main grid. And we discussed through interview and a survey um, this type of project with key stakeholders and we ranked benefit, but also the barriers or the concerns. We also elicited with a methodology similar to what uh, Martina has described, what were the emotions attached to the technology that were new to the community. And we also we tried to map how, whether the project was perceived as fair and whether the community wanted to be involved somehow in decisions or even financing. My fourth recommendation um, really connects to the topic of this webinar, the dynamics. We suggest the private developer to develop a continuous engagement strategy with dedicated resources and dedicated leadership. This consists of a limited set of action that address the barriers, uh, target the target engagement groups, and try to involve the local ambassadors. These actions need to be adaptive, like adapted in the changing dynamics in the community. And this can be done how we did it in the ELAN project by monitoring this com community engagement action uh, by means of key performance indicators over time and try to adjust them if uh, they are not performing the way we would like to or whether something changed uh, in the community. The idea is really uh, not to stop once the permit is granted to continue following during the life of the project. And fifth recommendation may be the tricky one and address also um, the theme of professional opposer that was mentioned in the first presentation. Um, project developer has to be prepared to face strong opposition. That happens, it's usually from a vocal minority, so you have to be ready. Part of risk management is really about uh, this part and the way to do it would be the re ready to facilitate in an accessible and low cost way, conflict resolution. So address concern as, like, as soon as possible and be aware of the mechanism for resol resol resolving conflict, which is in place there. And whether, it's, whether some, there's something that can be done. So to sum up, so these are five learnings from field experience, uh, but also reviewing best practices that are based on our work on community engagement in the ELAM project and will be used uh, to present a structured methodology to implement when, when someone wants to, um, the project developer wants to realize clean energy project. And it also works together with other uh, business innovation models, tools, and other technological tools that help establishing clean and local energy systems. So with this, I conclude my part. I very much look forward to your questions. The methodology we are developing is still in the process. Uh, so if you have any input you want to share, please reach out to me or feel free to ask any comment. Thank you. Thank you, Bea, um, for sharing your results from the ELAN project with us. I think it was overall really interesting to see the overlaps between the three presentations and to see that the findings that you had in the ELAN project kind of match the experience that Matteo shared at the beginning, how important it is to identify local ambassadors or key persons in, in the community, also how important it is to communicate from the beginning on and then also the, the similar experiences um, from Martina, the results and the ex experiences Matteo shared that it is, seems to be easier to mobilize against something, either being a project or a CO2 law, rather than promoting it. So I think one important open question is how could positive, positive aspects be communicated um, better? And there is one question in the chat towards uh, Martina that, that relates to this. So the question is, based on your insights regarding low awareness of the Swiss CO2 tax refund, what would you recommend to the next German government if they want to increase acceptance of increasing carbon prices? So how can you communicate um, these aspects uh, better? 
So um, I would say we can take some general recommendations from all the three presentations, but especially from Bea, I would say. Um, so first of all, we should like the communication also from the pro side should be should be there and should be positive. Because, for example, what what we found in, in the service that like, for example, for the for the for the mentioned arguments uh, against the CO2 law, a lot of a lot of arguments were like matching what the contra campaign was was stating. So um, if a pro campaign could do the same um, as the contra campaign did in the CO2 law, um, one could also think again to these shortcuts that say from the from, from the advertisements and also maybe see some positive elements of of implementing such a co2 law um, and also increasing carbon prices and especially um i think what is done wrong for now at the moment or read wrong is that the communication for now from the side of the pro campaign of such an increase of carbon pricing is oftenly um, mentioning rather like fearful elements, like saying, yeah, if we don't implement anything right now, it's going to cost lives and, and also like to, to like not benefit our society in 20 years. But people not really can, cannot really imagine how to live in 20 years. And also like fear is not a good key to um, successfully find people in favor of something. And so hope or enthusiasm as emotions can can rather be uh, important to that. And so also like um, campaigns such as COP is doing, for example, in Switzerland, um, which insists on every human being's um, um, success when finding products from COP, for example. The same could be applied in the in the climate politics and saying what exactly can one find from increasing prices for now but what is the what is the effects of them in the future and what can be learned from this thank you very much um i think also relating to this is that how do you if there's polarization in in a community and you already have groups groups already formed you have strong opposition how do you facilitate a discourse without um kind of aggravating the polarization between the the groups Maybe Matthias, you can share your experience or your view on that. You are still muted, sorry. <laughs> I cannot hear you. Yeah, we face that uh, especially in, in wind farms or discussion regarding projects, uh, the, the opposites are mainly uh, older people. So it's 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 really difficult to to make them aware of uh, of this yeah negative effects of uh, climate change and so on. So for them, it's just uh, important what is right now. And I think this is also in in discussion with CO two prices and so on. They just see yeah it's cost it costs money now and also. I have to change. I have to change something in my life. Nobody wants to change anything. It's comfortable like it is. So it's always much, much easier um, to be against anyway, and and uh, and and uh, to to change that that to get people moving or changing something in their life is really quite a big task. So um, yeah, it's just. Uh, repeating again and again and again uh, why it is necessary, uh, trying to convince them, having really opinion makers and, and uh, to get them involved and uh, yeah, to get people convinced. But it's really, it's a hard task. So it's <laughs> consuming a lot of time. That's why we have also already in all our projects, uh, responsible people just doing the campaign for the project which was not necessary 10 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the status quo bias that you described, it's something that is really difficult to, to overcome and enabling change is always more difficult than defending the status quo. Um, there was a question to Bea. Um, I'm just gonna read it. Very interesting approach to understand the community values and preferences. 
how would you deal with the heterogeneous preferences if you have a choice between two wind sites and they both have similar average preferences, but one is more polarized than the other? What would you recommend? Um, yes, thanks for this question. Also connected to the previous one on polarization. Um, I would say like it's very common to have heterogeneous preferences, so we have to deal with this um, in terms of, uh, for instance, our experience in the EDAM project is township we wanted to have more solar uh, was facing polarization uh, between the urban and the rural parts because the rural part would have experienced a lot of new grid lines coming uh, through uh, area which was actually covered by trees and they didn't want to have these trees cut. And there was this clear divide between this urban part who wanted to have more energy and the rural parts who didn't want to have the grid lines. So, and that community is very much into carbon neutrality. So it's really their statement. So even in a very like green community that could happen. Uh, so it's, I would say it's very important. How do we deal with that? In that case, we met uh, the, we suggest to met those who were um, against the project on their ground. So, and really try to address the knowledge, the gaps that were fueling their concerns a lot. So one strategy would be, so the, the part who strongly opposed the project to try to meet them on their ground. So visit them in the rural part, have some, info days, or in our case, these people don't meet much because of the COVID now. So we had this idea to, they have a very much used internal social network that there will be like um, short pieces about energy and how energy is produced, uh, about grid lines and their benefit uh, daily or weekly. So they can actually learn more and by being becoming more knowledgeable, they could form um, decisions that we hope will be less against. So that's a way to try to um, try to balance uh, different views by in education. So that's an approach. Um, and if you have to choose between two, like project developers, there are other factors. Um, I would say that very much depends on each situation, so it has to be studied. Um, but in general, I think the education approach and meet on the ground, the those people who are more concerned could work. Thank you very much, Bea. Um, there were a couple of more questions in the chat. Um, there is one to Matthias. Um, about that acceptance might not be the only reason for slowing down the scaling up of the installation of wind power, but it's also the competition with PV, um, which produces the kilowatt hours at a cheaper price. And the question is, do you think the discussed new winter tariff for power from the utilities can change this gap with a solar in the future? Uh, I don't know this uh, <laughs> special regulation, but uh, generally, um, I think it's very important to, it's both is needed, definitely. So we know that uh, um, uh, wind power, uh, two thirds of them is generated uh, in the winter half year. So uh, it, um, yeah, it's both necessary. And um, we see, I think, especially for Switzerland or Austria, uh, there is not a big potential for really utility scale uh, solar. So uh, like our Spanish colleagues do with 180 hectare and more. Um, so the prices for solar in our countries will not be that cheap, definitely, because it's a, a smaller project. So I think they are more or less on the same level in, in, in uh, Austria and Switzerland. And uh, very important is to have um, the subsidies uh, separated, so technology-wise, and not in one uh, uh, basket. So uh, this is uh, this is done in, in, in Austria. This is in the new law um, foreseen, and uh, yeah, this ensures that both technologies are built and not uh, yeah having competition. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this shows how important the structure is as well and the policies. And there, there was one more question 
a question to you in regards to the impact on tourism. Um, mm -hmm. Tourism was wondering about the potential of wind or solar parks for tourism, and if you have specific collaborations or strategies with the regional and national tourism boards to exploit the potential of renewables for product development in tourism. Um, yeah, whether there Unfortunately, is not, <laughs> because the issue is, uh, I showed a few examples, and uh, there are there are more, of course, also in especially in in, in Eastern uh, Austria, but um, the issue is that they are all uh, have fear that uh, if there are wind parks or big, big uh, solar plants, that no tourist will come anymore. Uh, famous uh, talk we had is uh, they, they told us um, uh, the owner of the skiing area uh, told us that uh, if the people see the windmills turning they see there is wind and they will not go come skiing again so um, yeah this is of course not true um, but especially in the west side of Austria where the main tourism takes place skiing areas yeah there is a big fear having wind parks there and um, so there is not really a cooperation or collaboration with the uh, tourism agencies uh, and yeah this this will take this will take time uh, and uh, the western part is also not uh, there is not the big the big potential for wind farms so the big potential is more on the east side okay um, there was just now another question addressed to you, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the question is whether in your experience it's more effective to increase community acceptance uh, through communication or through sharing financial benefits? It's uh, both is needed. Uh, we have a very, of course, um, very strict compliance regulations, so it's getting more and more difficult uh, to um, yeah, to financial regulations, but we're looking more for, uh, as I said in the presentation, improvements of uh, the infrastructure. For example, the municipalities are more and more asking for charging stations for uh, electrical vehicles and so on. So this is what we provide and what really fits also uh, for our projects because we can provide renewable energy and they charge renewable energy, which is, of course, the aim not to charge from coal power plants. Uh, and... Um, and generally, it's, they are looking more for uh, a concept where we try to do a concept for the municipality, which uh, which were like charging stations uh, and or and improving forest roads, removing overhead lines, uh, doing tourist concepts. So they want to have really yeah everything in which which they can present their voters in future. So it's not. Yeah, 10,000 euros or whatever more. This is not a lot for a municipality. So it's better to present and then that the inhabitants see what is done and what uh, the mayors and so and so on did for them. So this is, uh, yeah, Very gets more and more common. Um, thank you. Very interesting. Um, and we had a question to all speakers. Um, whether you think that the current price increases in European gas and power markets could be an opportunity to increase social acceptance of renewables. Maybe Martina, you wanna answer first? Um, hmm. Well, it's different, to, uh, it's difficult to say, but I would say that yes, it can be a kick, kicking off movement, <laughs> let's say to, to convince people that the car might not be the, the only um, method to transport oneself. Um, but it's also a question to not only, I would say it's one part of the, of the increasement of social acceptance of renewables, um, because uh, yeah, I mean, gas prices are going to increase more and more. And so is also the, the oil prices. Um, so one needs to find alternatives and when informing maybe also people what they have as alternatives and maybe also subsidizing what um, they like the renewables as has been done in Switzerland until now and is also part until 2030 I guess um, is also another crucial part to also convince people that gas and um, oil is not the only solution. 
Thank you. Maybe Bea next. Yes, I would gladly take on this one. So whether, okay, the recent increase in gas and electricity prices could impact social acceptance of renewables. I would say uh, yes, for two, at least for two reasons. First reason is that sometimes we see for a specific project that the community is not moved to act for the project because energy is not their topic, it's not their daily topic, it's not something that they spend some time on it or whether the local uh, player consider this to be key to their activities. So it's not a very salient topic, right? So I think increasing the salience of this topic could lead to more informed decisions. And when you look into this, of course, uh, renewable energy have a lot, have a lot to, to, to play with because I mean, the, usually the associations to, to this technology are very positive. So we're not talking about things that people don't like in principle. And the other consideration would be, I think that would push people more into producing in a local way. So consuming what is produced locally. And of course, renewables are better in this sense, right? Because I mean, you feel protected from energy prices that are generated somewhere like far away from you. And so you want to have your own power, you want to produce it close to you so that you have more control on it. And this is something that renewables can give you in Europe at least. <laughs> I, think, I think you're thinking about Europe now. Yes, yes. Thank you. And then um, we had one, uh, we have time for one last question that was uh, raised about wind energy in Austria again. Um, so, there are differences in social acceptance of wind energy between the eastern and western part of Austria. And the question was, to what extent do you think that this might be shaped by state level political leaders? Or where do you see the reason for this difference? Um, yeah, the, the political leaders are of definitely one reason. Um, as we, yeah, one, one famous uh, uh, sentence from uh, the Tyrol <laughs> governor was uh, we are a land of uh, peak crossings and not of wind uh, parks. So of course, this is an opinion maker and everybody uh, remembers this sentence. This is really, really uh, yeah, awful. Uh, but um, it is, we, we definitely have to do a lot of uh, work there and, and, um, and the, the government in, in Vienna has to convince them, the political leaders. And the, the really uh, worst thing is that, that it takes time because when they were once against, they cannot change from uh, uh, today until tomorrow their opinion. So uh, they can only uh, make really small steps and that takes much too long. So it's just in case there is a new governor, then it can change earlier but yeah it will take time so they are definitely making opinion and um yeah have a have really big impact on the acceptance thank you very much so um being mindful of the time gonna um i would like to conclude now so First of all, I would like to thank all our speakers. So thank you very much for your presentations and for sharing your insights, your results and your experiences with us. I would also like to thank Bea for co-hosting and this webinar with me. And of course, thank all our participants for joining us today, for your interest in the topic and your interesting questions. Thank you. And we hope that we can welcome you again to our next webinar. So there's one next week about the emergence of solar mobility. And then we have our last webinar of this Greenback series in two weeks about net zero universities. So thank you again. And I hope you learned something today and you could take something with you. And I wish you a nice weekend. Goodbye. Thank you.